Disclaimer here at the beginning of the video, the creator of this game used to be a content creator back in the day that I was a really big fan of, and I primarily picked up this game just because I wanted to support him now that he's a game developer. So, of course, it's possible that my views of the game might be a bit biased. You know, I try to separate myself from those kinds of things, but, you know, it's always possible, so I figured I would just let you know ahead of time. Anyway, Garden Guardian, let's talk about this game. So, Garden Guardian is a game inspired by old-school Game & Watch games, actually. And I have never played a Game & Watch game before, so I have no nostalgia or connection to this type of game or anything. The closest thing I have is, back in the day, I had a bunch of those shitty LCD Sonic Heroes McDonald's Happy Meal toy games. Uh, that were really bad, so that's not exactly the best example to go on for, you know, these kind of simple LCD type games. So I'm pretty much going in fresh here, and initially I was thinking this game probably wouldn't have enough to warrant talking about in its own dedicated video because of how simple these types of games usually are. I was thinking I might just throw this into kind of more of a roundup video of what I've been playing and watching and reading lately, but when I actually started playing the game, I found that there was actually a lot here worth talking about, so let's get into it. The way Garden Guardian works is very, very simple. You have five rows, and enemies are gonna come from the far side of the screen and make their way over to attack the rows, kind of similar to, like, Plants vs. Zombies. And if they manage to attack one of your plants, then you get a miss, and you can get three misses before it's game over. And the way to deal with enemies is to just be in the same position as them, and you'll automatically attack them. In addition to that, you also have to try to grow your plants, and you do this by when you kill enemies, then you get this plant food that goes in your basket in the top of the screen. And you can take this plant food to the carnivorous plant on the right side of the screen and feed it, and that will make your other plants grow. And once your plants are fully grown and ripened, then you can just move to that position and you'll harvest that plant, which gives you some points. And it's important to empty your basket frequently, because once your basket has more than five plant food in it, then you're going to start to slow down, which can be a problem in certain situations. However, if you wind up in a situation where you have too much plant food and you can't get rid of it, then there's also a button that you can press to just empty your basket right then and there, which obviously isn't ideal because that's leaving points on the table, but sometimes you end up in emergency situations where you need that movement speed right now. And that is pretty much the entire core idea of the game. As I said, very, very simple. Pretty much exactly what you would expect for a Game & Watch style game. You just got five inputs, movement in the four directions, and the one button to empty your basket. That's the whole thing. And yeah, when I just explain it like that and you watch the gameplay here, it really doesn't seem like that much. But that's because this is just the early parts of the game when you're playing on the easier difficulties. When you start to get to the harder stuff in the game where the speed starts to really ramp up, this game starts to get pretty damn fun, and it starts to reveal that there's actually quite a bit of depth to this game, despite how simple it is. I mean, first of all, just speeding up the game, like with any game like this, like a Tetris or whatever, just that makes things a lot more difficult and a lot more intense, as you have to make decisions much more quickly and act upon them much more quickly and precisely. And with really simple games like this, that kind of speed and challenge is really where a lot of the fun comes from. Like, rhythm games are the exact same way. You play a rhythm game on a low, easy difficulty, and they're incredibly boring, but you ramp that up, and they start to get really fun. The same is true here in Garden Guardian, but what especially caught my attention is that once you get to these higher speeds and higher difficulties, you start to realize that there is a lot more to this game than first meets the eye. The way I see it, there's three major elements that make up the gameplay of Garden Guardian and everything you have to do. The first part would be dealing with the enemies, and specifically how you go about dealing with them. Cause you have the three different enemy types, you have the small little like mushroom shaped guys that move at a decent movement speed, you have the spider enemies that move really really fast, and then you have the ant looking guys that are the slowest enemy type but also take two hits to kill. The first hit is just gonna knock them back a distance and then they're gonna come at you again. And just with that, with those three simple enemy types, it can make identifying what to do when you're at these higher speeds 
pretty difficult a lot of the time, because this is a game of constantly having to analyze the current situation and make decisions about what is the best way to handle the situation. And as you get up to the higher speeds and higher difficulties, enemies are going to come at you in extremely high volume very, very quickly, and the gaps in between the time you have to kill the enemies get smaller and smaller and smaller, making less room for mistakes where an enemy reaches the plants and it's doing its wind-up animation before it attacks. That makes it so it becomes very, very important to correctly identify which enemy is going to reach your plants first and dealing with them in order. And with all the factors in the game, that can sometimes be a really difficult puzzle to figure out. Just the three enemy types can make that pretty difficult. If you have a slow-moving enemy spawns and then a spider spawns shortly after it, the spider might make it first, the other enemy might make it first, sometimes it becomes very tight and gets difficult to tell what's gonna happen. You really need to develop a familiarity with all of the enemies and their movement speeds and patterns to really start to get a feel for who's gonna arrive first in all these situations, and this is an ever-changing problem because dudes are always spawning. Another thing that affects this is the actual positions of the five different plants in the rows. As you can see, they are not aligned vertically, and that actually does matter. Enemies will reach the middle row faster than they'll reach the ones on the outside, and so on and so forth. So it's not always as simple as this enemy is faster than that enemy, so they're gonna make it first, because sometimes that slower enemy might be on a row where it's going to reach your plant first, so that just adds an extra layer of inconsistency and uncertainty to the decision making here. There's another factor that you need to be considering at all times. Also, it's worth mentioning, I'm pretty sure that the game is designed specifically in a way where enemies are never gonna come at you in an impossible to deal with situation, where two enemies will come at the very opposite rows at the exact same time, and there's no way to deal with both of them. You always have enough time to deal with them, but sometimes that timing window gets so insanely tiny that you actually don't have time to deal with them. But one thing I noticed in this game is that there is hit stop every time you kill an enemy. And during that hit stop, you actually get a little bit of a head start against the enemies where you can move again before they can. And it really does seem like in a lot of the high level situations, you need to take advantage of this in order to get from one side to the other in order to kill the enemies. That is what can make it so difficult to figure out what order to deal with them all in, because without the hit stop, they seem like they're gonna approach at almost the exact same time, and the tiniest mistake can make the difference between one of them hitting you and one of them not. And actually, that hit stop is a godsend. It is so helpful with this problem, because every time you hit an enemy, the game freezes for a fraction of a second, and it might not seem like much, but if you're experienced with, like, action games and fighting games, you'll know that that tiny screen freeze is such a huge deal. It gives you so much additional time to figure out what you need to do and analyze the current situation. There's also hit stop when you go to feed the plant, so you can use that to, like, manually freeze the screen when you want to in order to get a better look at things if you're having a bit of trouble sometimes. So the hit stop is a really nice addition, though one problem that I do have with it that I ran into quite a bit while playing the game is that during the hit stop, sometimes your inputs will get eaten, and that's caused me to not do the thing that I wanted my character to do. I pressed the number of ups or downs correctly, but because I pressed one of them during the hit stop at the wrong time, oh, my character didn't move and that caused me to take a hit. That was really, really annoying, to be honest. But that's really the only major problem I have with the game. One last thing I want to talk about when it comes to just analyzing the enemy patterns and figuring out how to deal with them is the enemies in this game are very, very well shaped, which might seem like a bit of a weird compliment, but it's actually a very big deal because at the higher levels, when there are so many fucking things coming at you so goddamn quickly, you don't always have time to consciously look at every single enemy and internalize what they are and how they behave, but as you start to get more experience with the game, then you start to just recognize the enemies just based on their silhouettes. You see the shape of them, and you kind of just instinctively react to them in the correct way. And sometimes, you know, you're looking at your basket, you're looking at your character to know what position you're currently in, so you're not always looking at the far left side of the screen very much, you're kind of just looking at it from your peripheral. And with that, you do not 
have the information needed to identify small details on the different enemy types, but they are all shaped differently enough that even with a vague image of them from your peripheral vision, I was always able to correctly identify which enemy was which. So that was really well done. Now the second part of the game, after you've looked at the current situation and figured out what you need to be doing, the second part is now actually doing it. When this game starts to get difficult and fast and they are throwing a ton of enemies at you constantly, you need both speed and precision in order to correctly move into the right positions at the right times. At first it seems pretty basic and whatever, you know, you just move up and down, what's the big deal? But when there's so much shit flying at you, then just moving up and down turns into, okay, move up two rows, down one, up three, down one, up one, down two, down one. Press right twice to feed the plant, press left, press up, press down, press up twice, press down three times. And so on and so forth. You are constantly being thrown with this very precise, very fast input challenge that you need to be doing all the time. It's one thing to press directions on a D-pad quickly, but it's another thing to press it both quickly and with control. And control you are definitely going to need, because as I said, you get in a lot of situations where the enemy patterns come at you with very, very little time in between. And so even the tiny amount of time it takes to move to the wrong position and then correct for that, that can sometimes be your death in certain situations. If I were to compare it to something, actually, I would say this is kind of similar to playing DMC3, where you have access to all of the weapons at once, because in that game, in that situation, you have five weapons that you have to toggle through very quickly, and there's a lot of precise input needed in order to correctly get to the right weapon that you might want. You gotta consider what weapon you currently have and how many presses it's gonna take for you to go around the wheel and get to the weapon you want. And depending on what weapon you currently have and what weapon you're looking to equip, that is constantly going to be a changing number of presses, and it's the exact same thing here in Garden Guardian, Going up and down constantly, you have to think about how many presses it's going to take to go up, to go down, to go up again, to go down twice. It's another thing that adds to that decision making that you need to make at the beginning phase of not just like, here are the enemy patterns and they're coming at me, I need to be in this position, that position, and then that position in that order, but you also need to think about what inputs it's going to take to make that happen. And that just adds an additional further thing that you gotta be thinking about. And actually, what I found in this game is that it goes a little bit deeper than that, because bizarrely, a game this fucking simplistic, where you can only move between seven different positions, somehow this game has movement tech. What the fuck? Because I noticed while playing that in order to get to the plant to feed it, you have to tap right twice, and then to get back to the front lines, you also have to tap left twice. But then I started to think, what would happen if I pressed up or down when I'm in that middle position there, and as I suspected, you move to either the second or fourth row, depending on what you press. So that is a minor little optimization you can make, where after you feed the plant, you don't have to go left again to the middle row and then up or down, you can just go right to either the second, third, or fourth row. In certain situations, that can save you one movement, and that amount of time can absolutely be the difference between you getting that enemy and you not. But then, as I was getting further into the game, I started to think about a potential other application for this. Because when you're at the far rows, in order to get to the row on the very opposite side, it takes four inputs to get there. You know, you gotta press down four times or up four times, and sometimes that can make it really difficult to get to the opposite side of the screen in time. But then I realized that if I go to that middle position instead, then I can get to the opposite side of the screen in just three inputs instead of four. If I'm at the top of the screen and I need to get to the bottom, then I can just press right down down and boom, I'm there. And actually, if you just need to get to the fourth row, that's still faster too. It's only two inputs as opposed to three. And this is a very minor little optimization, but it absolutely can be a really big deal in certain situations. It can be a total lifesaver in situations where you don't exactly correctly judge which enemy is going to arrive first, you can actually get to those far side positions faster and save yourself sometimes. And actually, I started to incorporating moving to the middle into my play quite a bit as I got even further into the game because I found that it can sometimes make figuring out how to get to the position you want to a lot easier. Because instead of having to count the number of spaces from where you currently are and where the enemy is and, you know, make sure that you precisely press that number of ups or downs, 
Instead, it will kind of turn into specific inputs that will send you to a certain position. For example, if I need to get to the second row, then right up. Doesn't matter where I am on the screen, right up will always get me there. Right left will get me to the middle, right down will get me to the fourth row, and even the far edge is right up up, I'm at the top. Right down down, I'm at the bottom. And sometimes that can make figuring out how to get where you want to a lot easier. It's just one less thing you need to think about. Instead of ever changing inputs to get to the right position, if you just drill into your head what position matches what input, then you can quickly shortcut in your brain right to, if I need to get to this row, I do that. If I need to get to that row, I do this. If I need to get to that row, I do that. And so on and so forth. In those situations where you're being really overwhelmed with a lot of enemies and you don't have a lot of time to think, this can sometimes help you out and alleviate some of the pressure so you have more attention that you can put to just identifying the enemy pattern. Additionally, even if it didn't get me around in any less inputs, I still found it worthwhile to do this kind of middle movement a lot of times, just because it's physically faster to do it than pressing the same direction multiple times. You know, I can more quickly roll my thumb from right to down than I can double tapping down. There's a lot more motion in that where you have to entirely press the button and release before you can get to the next input as opposed to just rolling your thumb from one input to the other before the first one even ends. So yeah, all of that stuff is all there and available for you and when you're playing this game at the high speeds, it turns into a real dexterity challenge in a way a lot of games, even like fighting games and character action games, don't really often turn into. Really the only other genre of game that I find gets to be like this is stuff like rhythm games when you're playing at those really high difficulties, where the physical skill needed to quickly and precisely play the game correctly that takes work. It's not like where the inputs are just the manifestation of your desires in the game. In order to do what you want to do correctly, you need to get good at the game and play well and precisely. The dexterity needed adds an extra layer to the fun. And all of these higher level optimized movement techniques that you could use they actually kind of work a little bit as a double-edged sword when you start to implement these things once you figure them out, because at first they actually make the game much more difficult because that's just another thing you need to think about. It's just like any game where you learn new techniques as you get better and better, where you have to actively think about incorporating these into your play, looking for situations where it would actually be worthwhile to do these things, and then remembering that you have that available, remembering how to do it, doing it correctly when you're not as practiced with that kind of input. Somehow this incredibly simple game is giving me like fighting game vibes when I learn a new combo and I'm trying to incorporate that into my play. And just like with fighting games, while at first it can actually be more difficult as you have even more things to consider which is going to slow down your ability to correctly figure out what to do, as you start to get better and better it starts to become more natural. By this point when I play the game, I utilize all of the different ways you can move. Sometimes I just move up and down, sometimes I use that middle movement tech. It's just whatever is good for the situation, or whatever feels right in my current situation. Sometimes I don't always do the optimal thing because I'm in too much of a panic and I just do whatever I think is going to work. And once you get these things drilled into your head, then a lot of times you will just kind of naturally do the thing you need to do. But the layers of decision making here in not only how do you deal with the current situation, but how are you physically going to get around to make it happen? I am completely shocked that a game this simplistic can have this much depth to it in this kind of way. And then the third part of the game is dealing with the basket and feeding the carnivorous plant. At first when I started playing the game I was thinking, oh, I'll just wait till the basket is nearly full and then drop it all off. But the problem there is the movement speed penalty you get when you're over halfway filled. As you're getting to those higher levels and things are coming at you this freaking quickly, there are a lot of times where you really do not want to have to deal with that movement speed penalty. And so actually you want to be emptying your basket as often and as much as possible. Not only do you have to deal with all the enemy patterns and who's gonna arrive first and all that, but you also need to look for those gaps where you have enough time to go over to feed the carnivorous plant. To make another comparison, to me this feels very similar to like when you're playing a zombie shooter and there's just that endless horde of zombies coming at you, and you need to look for those gaps so you have time to reload, because if you get caught in a situation where you run out of bullets, 
you might end up getting fucked, so you have to make sure you're topped up at all times. It's the exact same thing here. Although actually it can be even more challenging because you can't just reload whenever you want because you can only do it when the carnivorous plant has its mouth open. So you can absolutely end up in situations sometimes where you miss the bus on feeding the plant and then it closes and then there's a bunch of enemies coming and you have to deal with them and now you're starting to get encumbered because you're carrying all this food and then there's too many enemies coming at you and there's not time to get to the plant while its mouth is open and so now you're just like, God, you can really fuck yourself over if you don't take those opportunities when they present themselves. Of course, you can make this easy for yourself by just always dumping your basket and then you never have to worry about it, but then you're leaving points on the table, and obviously you don't want to do that. You're trying to aim for a high score. That's the whole point of the game. And you especially do want to be growing those plants because sometimes there are one-up plants that will give you an extra hit point back, so you want to be growing plants as much as you can. And so in addition to the situational awareness and the input challenge that this game presents, you also have this resource management challenge that you constantly need to be thinking about. Once I got to a certain point in this game, I didn't even look at the basket at the top of the screen anymore. You kind of just get a feel for, okay, I've killed about this many enemies, so I'm probably about halfway filled on the basket now. I should look for an opportunity to empty it when I can. I mean, really, it just started to turn into muscle memory, where any time I saw a gap large enough, I would just double tap right whether or not the plant was open or not. But sometimes that actually would also end up screwing me where I incorrectly judged a gap and that would cause enemies to get hits on me. And then even further, you do sometimes run into those situations where you are over encumbered and there's way too enemies coming. You don't have a gap and the plant's not even opening its freaking mouth when there are openings. So you're stuck with this slower movement speed and then there's a risk reward factor there to consider of do you want to dump out all of your stuff? Obviously it would be for the best if you could deal with this situation while slowed down and then you could find an opportunity to feed the plant, but sometimes you just don't have that, and sometimes you just have to make the call, fuck it, emergency situation, I'm dumping all of this. When you need that extra speed boost, again, another thing to think about. How does this game that is this freaking simple have this much complexity to it? What the fuck? I am genuinely shocked by how much is going on in a game this simplistic. Is this what Game & Watch games are like? Jesus Christ, I need to freaking start playing some of those Game & Watch collections. So those are the three different aspects of the gameplay of Garden Guardian to me, and it's when they all come together that you create this game that is very, very challenging and difficult when you get to those high speeds in multiple different ways. It's constantly pushing you in different avenues to develop different skills that you all have to manage in tandem with each other. I'll be honest, when I first saw this game, I was like, oh, it's just a very simple little thing. Probably not going to be my cup of tea, but I'll give it a shot anyway. But now that I've actually played the game, I was stunned at how much fun I found this game to be. I was genuinely having a great time playing this game. I mean, I've been talking about it for this frickin' long, and it's a goddamn super simplistic game inspired by LCD games. Beyond the core gameplay, there are two modes for playing Garden Guardian. The first is an endless mode that has four different difficulties, and the second is a trial mode where you have a bunch of special levels that are kind of like challenge levels where they're gonna fuck with the rules of the game a little bit in certain ways to create unique little scenarios. And, uh, yeah, if you can't tell by the menus, the creator of this game is a big fan of Sakurai games. I'm almost surprised this game doesn't have one of those grids Kirby Air Ride style. Uh, I guess if anyone is worried about length, then in order for me to complete all the trials in the game and get all five stars on all the different difficulties in Endless Mode, it took me about five hours of play. And let me tell you, doing the last challenge and getting five stars on the hardest difficulty of Endless Mode, that took a lot of attempts. That was really freaking hard. At first, I was actually thinking I might not be able to do it, but I was just having so much fun going for it that I was just like, No! I'm gonna do these fucking challenges! Fuck you, Liam, I can do it! And it was a great time. It's been a long time since I played a game where upon failure, I'm like, no shit, god damn it, fuck you, god freaking shit, ah. I actually came really freaking close on both of those two times that were so annoying. I was at like 490 on the last challenge and I 
fucked it up. And then on endless mode twice, I was at like 450 and there was a heart plant right there and I just couldn't grow it and I fucked up. And, ah, it's so frustrating. But it's the good kind of frustrating where I get frustrated at myself because I'm like stupid idiot because I'm making mistakes and killing enemies in the wrong order or whatever. But of course, with a game like this, after you do everything, you still have the option to just play endlessly just to try to get a high score, which I definitely see myself doing in the future when I have free time. It's a really nice low commitment game where it doesn't take very long to do a round of it, so if I just have a little bit of time in between things, I can just load it up and start playing. Definitely one of the strengths that it inherits from those Game & Watch games, I assume. Uh, the art of the game is very nice, very pleasing and cute. Uh, I like the little quips that uh, the main character Snippy makes while you're playing through the game and navigating the menus, very charming. Uh, and the music is pretty good too, and it speeds up as you get faster and faster, and that really definitely adds to that feeling of panic. I was looking at the Steam reviews for this game, and I saw one person say that they found this to be a very relaxing game, and I'm like, are you fucking kidding? You call this relaxing? Jesus Christ. This is genuinely one of the most intense games that I've played in a long time. And you know what, actually, I was thinking about the game and its different mechanics and systems and how they all interplay with each other, and I was thinking, so, like, you have situations where enemies are coming after you, and you need to quickly and constantly analyze the situation and strategize how to optimally deal with all of the enemies. And doing that requires speed, skill, and precision in ways where it also sometimes incorporates motion inputs. And then you have a resource management system where if you boil over, then you're gonna end up hampering yourself, and that can fuck you over. And considering all that, I was like, this is a fucking action game, bro. Like, boil down to the absolute simplest it could possibly be. But all of the elements are there. A lot of the things that you think about when you play this game are the exact same kinds of things that you think about when you play, like, a beat-em-up or an action game or whatever. How the hell you manage to make a game this simplistic and give me flashbacks to playing character action games, I have no idea, but bravo, very well done. If someone wanted to get into action games, I would genuinely probably recommend this game to them. If they wanted to, like, really start to get good at action games and learn how to play them at a higher level, this game, despite being so different and so simple, it will start to teach you the fundamental ideas that you need to understand to play things like Devil May Cry or Bayonetta or whatever at a higher level. It kind of cuts to what makes action games fun, but makes it much simpler and more accessible, which is pretty awesome. I don't know, maybe it's a bit of a stretch to call this an action game. You do get kind of similar things when you play something like Tetris and it starts to get really fast too, but regardless, I really, really enjoyed Garden Guardian a lot, so definitely check this game out. I'm honestly really surprised how much I would recommend it, but Garden Guardian is really good. Thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed. I'll see you next time.